Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian. In this video, I'll continue a discussion of area between curves. The topic will be an application of area between curves to what's called the Gini index, a measure of income concentration. This material is from section 6.1, area between curves, more specifically pages 392 to 394, example 8, are relevant to this video. The corresponding homework is this short collection of just two exercises from section 6.1. Recall the theorem that was introduced in the video for homework 82, theorem about the area between curves for a simple region. Remember that a simple region is a region like this, where you have a top function, top parentheses x, and a bottom function, bottom parentheses x, that are continuous functions with the property that the y values on the graph of bottom are less than or equal to the y values on the graph of top on the interval a, b. And the theorem about these simple regions area was this. The area between curves, that is the unsigned area for this region, is given by this definite integral. You integrate top of x minus bottom of x from a to b. So the subject for this video is quantifying income inequality by the Gini index. The degree of income inequality in the U.S. is a common subject. One frequently hears mentioned the so-called 1%. It's generally understood that this refers to the relatively small group of people whose income is greater than 99% of the people in the country. The discussion about the 1% tends to be about the idea that most of the income and, and wealth in our country is concentrated in that small group of people. But beyond that vague idea, discussions of income concentration in the news are mostly not very quantitative. Well, there's a quantitative measure of income concentration that's based on measuring the area between curves. So it makes a nice subject for this chapter. The quantitative measure is called the Gini index. It's what we'll talk about in this video. The Gini index is computed using a definite integral involving a function called a Lorenz curve. In order to understand the Gini index, we must first learn about that curve. So we will talk now about what's called the Lorenz curve for a country. What you do is you rank households in the country by yearly income in increasing order. And you let x be the income percentile expressed as a decimal. For example, x equals 0.75 would correspond to the household income that's greater than or equal to the household income of 75% of the families in the country. Now note that x will be a number between 0 and 1. That is, x equals 0 would be the household income that's uh, the lowest household income in the entire country. And x equals 1 would be the household income that's uh, the greatest household income in the entire country because it's greater than or equal to 100% of the incomes of all the families in the country. Now, add up the household incomes for all the households at the X percentile or lower. And also, add up the household incomes for all the households in the country. Divide those two results to get a ratio. So the ratio will be the sum of all the household incomes for all the households at the X percentile or lower, divided by the sum of all the household incomes for all the households in the country. Now, what ratio you get depends on what the value of X was. So what we've got here is a function, a function of X. Now notice that that function will have values between 0 and 1. That will become clearer when we do an example, so I won't say anything more about that now. So once you get that function, you make a graph of that function, f of x. And the resulting graph is called the Lorenz curve for that country. In example one, we'll make Lorenz curves for three small island countries. Each country has only five households. Their incomes are shown in the table below. So island country one has five households, a, b, c, d, e, whose incomes are 10,000 a year, 20,000 a year, 30,000 a year, 40,000 a year, and 200,000 a year. Island country two has five households, A, B, C, D, E, whose incomes are 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100,000 per year. Island country three has five households, A, B, C, D, E, 
whose incomes are all pretty close to 60,000 a year. They're 58, 59, 60, 61, 62. So we can compute the data for the Lorenz curve for each country. We'll call their curves f of x, g of x, and h of x. We'll start by computing the data for the Lorenz curve f of x for island country 1. Now remember what we have to do. We choose a value of x, we add up all the household incomes for households at that x percentile or lower, and then we divide by this quantity, the sum of all the household incomes for all the households. So let's start with island country 1. To begin with, let's add up all the household incomes for all the households. Well, there are only five households. Here are their five household incomes. When we add up those numbers, we get $300,000 per year. That's the sum of all the household incomes for all the households in the country. Let's choose a value of x. Let's let x equal 0.2. That means we're thinking about the 20th percentile. That means the bottom fifth of all households. Well, we only have five households in ranked in order of income. They're A, B, C, D, E. So the bottom fifth is just household A. We add up that household income, which is just 10K, and we divide that 10K by 300K to get a ratio. 10 over 300 is 0 0.03. That's the value of F when X is 0.2. Now let's consider X equals 0.4. That corresponds to the 40th percentile. That is the household income that's greater than or equal to the household incomes for 40% of the households in the country. Well, what we're supposed to do is add up all the household incomes of households that are at that percentile or lower. That means the bottom 40% of households. Well, ranked in order, the households are A, B, C, D, E. That's five households. So the bottom 40% is just the bottom two households. When we add up their income, we get 30K. We divide 30K by 300K, and we get 0.1. Now, let's just jump to the end. When I consider income percentile x equals 1, that means that I need to add up all of the household incomes, that's 300, and divide by the sum of all the household incomes, which is also 300. That gives us a value of 1. Remember, I said that the values of f of x are between 0 and 1. We can see why that makes sense. The last entry in this table, the value of f when x equals 1, is the number 1. And of course, if we considered x equals 0, that means that we would not be uh, adding up any of the household income, so the numerator of our fraction would be the number 0, and that's why we would have f parentheses 0 would be 0, which is another thing that I mentioned. I mentioned that f of x is always greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1. Now we can do the same thing for island country 2. We can compute the, the Lorenz curve data using that table of incomes for island country 2. And the result is this table of data. And do the same thing for island country 3, resulting in these values. And then we can plot all those. Here are the plots of f of x, g of x, and h of x. Now notice that the, the graph of f of x stays fairly low and then jumps up near the end. That's because when adding up the household incomes, the incomes of the lower income households didn't amount to much. So when we computed the values of f for those, the numbers were pretty small the very last row of the table, we added in this very large household income, and suddenly the values of f jumped up to 1. That's why that blue graph jumps up the way it does. Now consider the red graph. The red graph stays right near that line, that black dotted line, which is the graph of y equals x. Now why does the red graph do that? Well, because all the households in this country earn roughly the same amount of money. So the graph of h of x 
goes up about the same amount each time I add in a new household, and the graph of h goes up about the same amount. Not exactly. Now that dotted black line, the graph of the equation y equals x, is called the line of absolute equality, because that represents the kind of hypothetical situation where all the households in the country had the same household income. So notice two things about these curves. One is that all three of the curves go through the points 0, 0 and 1, 1. We've discussed that before. Also notice that when household income is very concentrated, very unequally distributed, the Lorenz curve is very bowed. That is, look at the graph of that blue function. It's very bowed, and in that blue country, the household income was very concentrated. There was that one household, household E, that made $200,000 a year. So much of the country's income, household income, was concentrated in that one household. So when household income is less concentrated, more equally distributed, the Lorenz curve is less bowed and stays close to the line y equals x as we saw in the, the graph of island country um, 3, the graph of h of x. So that's the end of that example. Now I want to talk about the Gini index. So it's clear that countries with a high concentration of household income among the top income earners will have Lorenz curves that deviate a lot from the line of absolute equality, y equals x. Well, we'd like to quantify that deviation so that we can compare income concentration among nations. One straightforward way to quantify that income concentration is to just simply measure the area between the Lorenz curve, f of x, and the line of absolute equality, y equals x. So just measure this area of this region. Notice that that blue region is a simple region whose top curve is the line of absolute equality, that is, top of x is y equals x, and the bottom curve is the Lorenz curve, so the bottom of x function is f of x. So that means that that uh, unsigned area of that blue region would be the integral of top minus bottom, so the integral of x minus f of x, from x equals 0 to x equals 1. That's the idea behind the Gini index. The Gini index of income concentration for a country is defined to be twice the area of the region bounded by the Lorenz curve for the country and the line of absolute equality. So twice that definite integral of x minus f of x. A remark is in order here. The 2 is a scale factor that's put in so that the Gini index will always be a number between 0 and 1. Example 1. Find the Gini index if the Lorenz curve is f of x equals x squared. Well, the solution is that we have to set up this definite integral calculation. We have to use that formula for f of x, so we put the x squared there. That's the so-called bottom function. The top function is always y equals x. So we have this definite integral calculation to do. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that that can be computed by doing an indefinite integral calculation. A couple of things to notice. In the indefinite integral, we have two power functions. One has n equals 1, one has n equals 2. So we use the power rule with n equals 1 and n equals 2. And the result is this function form with a plus c. The plus c, the constant of integration, gets canceled in the first subtraction step. And we do careful arithmetic, and we end up with this result, that the Gini index is the number one-third. Question B. Find the Gini index if the Lorenz curve is g of x equals x cubed. Well, again, we set up the Gini index calculation. We have g of x being the bottom curve, and the line of absolute equality being the top curve, that is y equals x. So x cubed goes there, x is always there, then the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that this definite integral is equal to this computation involving the indefinite integral. To do the indefinite integral, we note that we have two power functions, one that has n equals 1, as before, 
and this time the other power function has n equals 3. So the end result, after all the integrating and careful arithmetic, the, the canceling of the constant of integration, the end result is that the Gini index is the number 1 half. Question C. Graph the two Lorentz curves along with the line of absolute equality. Well, here's a graph from Desmos with annotations. First of all, the line of absolute equality is the line y equals x. It goes through 0, 0, and 1, 1. I've got a typo here. This should say 0, 0. And it also goes through this point, 1 half comma 1 half. Then the Lorenz curve from question A was f of x equals x squared. It goes through 0, 0, and 1, 1, of course, because 0 squared is 0, and 1 squared is 1. And it goes through the point 1 half comma 1 fourth, because 1 half squared is 1 fourth. And then the Lorenz curve from question B, g of x equals x cubed, well, it also goes through 0, 0, because 0 cubed is 0, and 1 cubed is 1. And it goes through this point, 1 half comma 1 eighth, because 1 half cubed is 1 eighth. So notice that the green curve bows away from the line of absolute equality more than the blue curve bows. Now, some observations. Again, notice that all three of the graphs go through 0, 0, and 1, 1. Notice that the graph of g of x bows away from the line of absolute equality more than f of x bows. So here's g of x bowing away from the red graph more than the blue graph bows. And the third observation is notice that the function g of x has a larger Gini index. So the Gini index for the green function is the number 1 half and it equals twice that green shaded area. Whereas the Gini index for the blue function was the number 1 third, and that corresponds to, that equals twice that area. That's the end of that example, and that's the end of the video. Thank you.